Hello, my name is David Klebanov. I'm a leader in Cisco SD-WAN technical marketing organization. And today we're going to talk about SD-WAN and service insertion. Cisco SD-WAN comes with a great deal of security features. However, in some customer deployments, customers are looking to augment the security features of the Cisco SD-WAN fabric with their own layer 4, layer 7 services. This may or may not be related to security. However, the ability for the SD-WAN fabric to steer the relevant application traffic towards those services is important. Let's have a look. Many times when we talk about security, we're talking about a secure perimeter and establishing a secure perimeter. The key element of a traditional secure perimeters is a firewall. So let's take a look, what are the options of deploying firewalls? Traditional uh, firewall deployments were primarily revolving around positioning firewalls in the branch offices. And obviously, when you can see uh, that the firewall is positioned in the branch offices or in the remote offices, that means that every single remote office, every single branch office has a presence of the firewall. That may become challenging from the operational standpoint, let alone it costs money. The second deployment model is to centralize those firewalls in the main data centers. It is easier on operation because I don't have to operate as many firewalls. It's obviously easier to procure those because I don't need as many firewalls as well. However, it creates a certain inefficiencies as far as where that application traffic inspection actually occurs. As you can see, a traffic, if we didn't have this firewall, the traffic that originates from the user would have to be pulled all the way into the data center, consume the data center resources in order to get to the firewall for potentially being dropped. As you can see, this approach is wasteful. I am wasting the resources of the SD-WAN fabric and particularly the data center to bring this traffic to the data center for the firewall inspection. And it brings very little value because the traffic is going to be dropped anyways. So is there a better way to architect our solution and provide this stateful layer 4, layer 7 inspection when we're not talking about just the built-in Cisco SD-WAN security features, but also the ability to extend those to uh, Cisco firewalls or third-party firewalls and also beyond the firewalls into, into the intrusion detection and intrusion prevention devices, data leak protection, all sort of proxies. So the entire uh, gamut of the layer 4 through layer 7 devices. So let's, let's have a little bit of a different look into that in the context of SD-WAN. Let's talk about branch security. Let's not talk about just the perimeter, but let, let's first take a look at the branch security as a holistic item. There's a few things you can choose from in order to enforce that branch security. We're talking about segmentation, putting different types of traffic into different isolated VPNs, into different isolated segments. That is an inherent functionality within the Cisco SD-WAN. In addition to the segmentation, I can layer additional security to establish this branch security posture. I can have application filtering through the recognition of an application and then a simple drop or allow function. Stateless behavior. I can have a zone-based firewall for a stateful behavior. Obviously, it's different from the application filtering as, uh, in regard to how extent, extended that is and the visibility into the applications. Right? So you have the application filtering as a baseline and the zone-based firewall as a stateful extension of the application filtering. For some of the applications that are going to the cloud, we can use cloud security. And in this particular session, we really focused on this, what you can think about as a dedicated security. Something which is not inherent within the SD-WAN fabric, something that may not necessarily reside in the cloud, such as, for example, Cisco Umbrella Service, but a layer 4 through layer 7 service 
that can be inserted in the context of a specific VPN for a traffic of interest. So we perform the steering, the SD1 fabric performs the steering of the traffic between the users and the applications through this layer 4, layer 7 device. So as you can see, you have a choice of items in here to make sure that you choose the best security controls for the branch security enforcement. So let's look at this a little bit uh, in more details. So what do we see in here? So we see a remote office, and we see a data center. Our mission statement is to provide this dedicated stateful security for the traffic that goes between the remote office and the data center. If you recall the very first slide we looked at as far as how this was done traditionally, my options would have been to position a firewall in here or to position a firewall in here. So either the remote office branch office or in the data center. Right? This would have been the traditional things. Now I can use the SD-WAN approach of, like we said, application filtering, zone-based uh, firewall, potentially cloud security if this was not going to the data center. But how do I insert my dedicated security, my firewall, into this? So this firewall is a dedicated layer 4, layer 7 node. As we mentioned, it could be a Cisco firewall or it could be any third-party firewall. It's positioned with what you can think about as a regional hub. So what is a regional hub? Is a concept behind regionalization of those services. So it's not quite in the remote office. It's not quite in the data center. It is somewhere in between. This could be a hub facility. This could be a call facility. This could be a very well-connected branch office. Whatever that is, it's an entity in the SD-WAN fabric that hosts those layer 4, layer 7 security nodes. In our case, it is the firewall. As you can see, firewall is connected through multiple interfaces to this device, to this WAN Edge device. The reason for multiple interfaces is because firewalls in particular are observing the trust and untrust boundaries between the interfaces. So if you were to think about a population, a user population, as an untrusted population, and the applications in the data center are the trusted entities, then you can see that this red dot, this red interface, is actually pointing towards the users, and this green interface is pointing towards the applications. So the firewall can continue enforcing its trust and untrust zones exactly in the same manner as it would have been doing had it been installed in the branch office with one connection towards the users and another connection towards the WAN. So you see, we're really not changing the paradigm of the layer 4, layer 7 security node. We're just making it better positioned to service not just the branch office, not just the single branch office, and also not be all the way in the data center to incur additional latency and wastage quote unquote, of the bandwidth resources and data center, it is positioned in this regionalized fashion in the hubs, colos, or centrally positioned offices. Two interfaces. Now, in addition to that, the interfaces can be a physical interfaces, right? So we could be directly connected to this WAN Edge device. We also can be connected through a means of tunneling. Why is tunneling important? Well, in this particular case, we have the firewall having the luxury of being directly plugged into the WAN Edge device. It may not be the case in that particular uh, situation. I may have something that looks like this. I have an edge. I may have a router. And then I have the firewall. As you can see, I am no longer connected directly to this edge, uh, WAN Edge node. That may be just something that exists in that particular site. I cannot have this directly connected through whatever, you know, whatever reasons are, right? 
So in order for me to mitigate this intermediate hop, I can build an IPsec tunnel and make this firewall appear as if it's connected to the, uh, to the WAN edge device directly, when in fact it goes through an IPsec tunnel. In this case, two interfaces, two IPsec tunnels if that's the deployment model. So we support both directly connected and through IPsec using Ike version 1, version 2. Again, this is not an SD-WAN IPsec. This is not Cisco SD-WAN IPsec, which operates in the SD-WAN fabric. This is a standard-based, Ike-based version 1 or version 2 IPsec that gets stretched from the WAN edge device in this regional hub to the firewall that is in the regional hub. In case it's directly connected, it could be a routed service or a bridge service. So we're flexible for a routed firewalls and a bridged firewalls, exactly in the same fashion as you would have in a branch office or in a data center, where you may have a routing, routed firewall and a bridged firewall. So we, as I said, we're not changing any of the paradigms in the security node, just better positioning and having it shared resource across multiple sites. Right? Now, this node, the WAN edge node, I mentioned that the, one of the values of regionalization here is yes, shorter path towards the service. No longer do I have to go to the data center to be inspected. No longer do I have to put firewalls in every remote branch. By regionalizing, I'm shortening the path from the users towards the service for the security inspection to occur. So this connection is obviously has less latency than a connection between the office, remote office and the data center, and let alone does not consume the valuable resources of the data center, and it only consumes the resources of this regional hub, and I can have many of those regional hubs based on the geographies. So I'm distributing the problem around rather than centralizing it all in a data center. So the, um, the device where, where this uh, service is connected, this WAN edge device where this service is connected, is actually performing an advertisement of this service using OMP. So that's those the, um, uh, dotted blue connections are actually an OMP connections. So we're advertising this service. Why is this important that we advertise this service? Well, in this particular case, we just had one remote office. But imagine a situation, which is obviously very practical and very real in every SD-WAN deployment, is I have multiple branch offices. So the problem that I have described earlier is actually magnified. So I'm not just dealing with one office. I need to now cater to the ability to provide this regional inspection, this regional secure perimeter for not just one office, but for multiple offices. So this node, this regional, uh, regional hub, this WAN edge node in the regional hub is advertising this firewall as the service so other sites, not just one site, but other sites too, can use that. And I can use policies to steer the traffic of interest towards the service. So as you can see, it's very simple. Connect the firewall. Two connections, most likely, directly connected or IPsec tunnels, routed or bridged, connected to the network, advertise it in OMP messages that everybody now knows that there is a service called firewall that is available, and use policies to steer the traffic that goes from the branch offices into, let's say, data center through this intermediate node before it's allowed to go to the data center. So if I had to perform a drop uh, action that we had kind of mentioned earlier, I don't have to waste data center resources. I don't have to bring this traffic to the data center. I can just bring this to this remote regional hub and make the inspection there. And as I said, if, you are, if I were to look at this in a global scale, then think about this as having a global SD-WAN network with some remote site communicating through the regional firewall 
in one location and some other remote sites communicating with the regional firewall in a different location. So really kind of the power of regionalization of services comes to play and it may not be very evident when you're looking at just a single location, but when you start looking at that as more holistically and to, as, as an entire fabric, it starts making more and more sense. Now the question, am I limited to a single service? Absolutely not. So it's a little bit more advanced. It's a little bit more uh, sort of complicated the, uh, as far as topology is concerned. Yet it has the same philosophy exactly as what we mentioned earlier. I still have my remote site. I still have my data center. I have one or more regional hubs. So these hubs, these colo locations, I have one or more of those. If I have one, I can connect different services, and the two that mostly popular are the firewalls and the IDS or the IPS. So you either want to detect or prevent, potentially both. But I can chain my traffic. So in this case, we're elevating that from just the service insertion into a service chaining because I'm chaining my traffic that goes between the two locations within the fabric through two different service nodes that may or may not reside in the same location. In this case, same location, if I wanted to put a firewall in one regional hub and in fact create a farm of firewalls in that regional hub, and then I can create a farm of IDS, IPS appliances in a different hub, the same logic would apply. I would still advertise these services, so service advertisement or the positioning of them would come first. The service advertisement, something that happens next, and the policy enforcement is what actually makes this application traffic be uh, steered through those service nodes. And again, same site, they would be steered through the same site, different sites, it would go to regional hub A, get serviced by the firewall, if allowed, go back into the SD1 fabric, get serviced by the, uh, get uh, redirected to another uh, regional hub, regional hub B, and then encounter IDS, IPS appliance and get serviced there. So really don't have to, multiple services, they don't have to live in the same site, right? So same logic, not changing any of the paradigms of the firewall with two connections, IDS, IPS normally may have a single connection. They don't really observe trust or, or untrust boundaries. If they do, great, I can actually have two connections. To create these policies obviously requires a little bit of planning because as you can see, it's not as easy. You have potentially multiple devices. It's no longer applying the policy to just the branch offices or the data centers. You can now see that as the traffic emerges from the first service and goes into the SD1 fabric, it actually needs to know what to do next and not to go straight to the data center, for example, because there's a separate additional node that needs to be uh, put in pass. So as you can see, we also have to extend this policy into the nodes that are hosting those service nodes in order for the traffic to be steered to the second node rather than to the destination, which would normally happen if I only had one node. Right. So more considerations, however, exactly the same, uh, the same, uh, the same values.